I'd like to repeat your welcome and say on behalf of the St. James Lutheran Church Missions Committee, welcome to all of you who are joining us and welcome to others who may watch the recording at some time in the future. We're happy to have you with us. Uh, during this time of pandemic, it seems that many things in the church have ground to a halt. And so I hope you'll be pleasantly surprised this evening to discover that there are things going on in our uh, Indian partner church that may be uh, good news to you, pleasant surprises to you. I hope that this will uh, also inform and enrich your prayers. And so I'd like to introduce a man who is familiar to many, if not all of you, Dr. Paul Dossery, who has for many years been very dedicated to the work of the Bible Faith Lutheran Church in India and has come to be a good friend. Uh, I'll turn things over to you now and thank you very much, Paul. Good evening. Thank you, Pastor Albrecht, members of uh, the St. James Mission Committee, members of uh, St. James Lutheran Church and other friends. I'm very honored and privileged to be able to share with you about the work of the Bible Faith Lutheran Church of India. We'll refer to this as the BFLC going forward. On a cold evening such as this, it's wonderful to, uh, to, to, to gather together to see the workings of the Lord. Looking back at the years that, of the work that the Lord has done and as we look forward. I would like to briefly introduce myself again. Uh, for some of you, uh, I'm, uh, I'm the director, one of the directors of the Bible Faith Lutheran Church, a position uh, and a privilege that I've had to serve for the last 20 years. Now, uh, the title is Meet a Missionary, but I'm not necessarily a missionary in the sense of the word that we might understand it. Um, I'm, I work as a physician here in the Twin Cities. Uh, I have a family and I don't have any formal theological training, but as my late father, Reverend Rao, had often reminded us that not being ordained is no barrier to be able to work for the church and to show our time and talents towards building the church. So thank you again for the wonderful introduction. We'll go to the next slide. Our mission here, the Bible Faith Lutheran Church is an independent confessional Lutheran church in Southeast India. As many of you know, India is the second largest country by people, and it contains nearly a fifth of the world's, uh, one, uh, one fifth of the world's population. The majority of the people are Hindu, about 80%, uh, Muslim make up about 15%, and Christians make up a little over two point, uh, a little over two and a half percent, which translates to about 32 million people in India who are Christian. Now, our BFLC work has been involved in four broad areas of concentration. Uh, and it's helped to, helpful to categorize because we're rather spread out. The first one is congregational, was the very first uh, ministry that we were involved in. And along with that came the social projects uh, because we work in a poorer country. And then uh, we moved on to education, uh, which also started from the beginning with our pastoral teaching and training. And then eventually in the last few years, we really pushed the, our contribution to the theological literature in India. Now, looking at our churches, right, currently we have 35 congregations that are served by 30 pastors. Our social ministry uh, commitment started back in 1984 when we started the Moriah Children's Home. And, uh, and, and we have ongoing support for the home. We have also 40 widows in our congregations that we continue to support. Now, these are widows that have no family, uh, no extended family. So they really rely on the church and, and, and uh, the, the congregation members to, to support. Now, we've also done some various uh, project, uh, ministry as well such as back in 2004 when we had the Indian tsunami uh, and various other natural disasters. Uh, we've had uh, a number of uh, other simpler projects such as build, uh, digging wells for clean water. So that's always been uh, something that, that came along the, the ministry of, of, of uh, the church. 
Now, the education focus has involved both uh, theological and parochial education in the form of establishing a, a, a seminary and the Moriah School, which we will go into uh, going forward. Now, our literature projects, which I'll touch on briefly and we'll go over it a little bit more towards the end, has become a bigger part of the mission of the BFLC. This included our desire and near completion of translating the Book of Concord and various small topical books, such as Did My Baptism Count? And, uh, and, uh, and now we are transitioning to a, a lot, much larger project mm -hmm. as, we're, as we're translating the Lutheran Study Bible. Now, a good way to look at the history of the BFLC is to look at it in, in the past, and we can divide this up in, into three eras, so to speak. Now, our foundational years date back from 1978 to 2000. That was the years when the BFLC was established by my late father, Reverend Bhushan Rao. We started with a few congregations among fishing villages near the Krishna River Delta, where there were no churches. There were people mostly ignored by the government and uh, other uh, NGOs. Even though the work began in 1978, uh, under the uh, title of Bible Believing Lutheran Church, it was formally incorporated as the Bible Faith Lutheran Church in 1980. Now, the BFLC has worked independently with many partners throughout its history, including individuals, churches, and synods. The last five years of my father's life was involved with working with the Wisconsin Synod until his eternal calling in the summer of 2000. Now, at that time, the BFLC leadership had asked our, our family to continue to step in and to continue to, to do the, uh, continue the work uh, that my father started. So now, starting in 2000, that was uh, in the summer of 2000. So that started the next phase of our church, which I would describe as the growth years. So that would be in the last 20 years. And... Uh, and it really started with our partnership with the St. James Lutheran Church in the fall of 2000. And St. James has been our home base for our ongoing church work for the past 20 years. Here are some examples. St. James has supported the BFLC churches, school, and seminary on a monthly basis. This also included uh, the church providing pastors and mission teams that have regularly come and visited our churches strengthened our believers, and even as they were strengthened in their own faith, and, uh, and continue to uh, nurture the, 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 our Christian uh, bonds with each other. Uh, our our St. James pastors have provided pastoral guidance to the BFLC pastors and to the BFLC leadership. Uh, they have also been involved in teaching in the seminary and also uh, have been involved in all four seminary graduations that we've had in the last 20 years. In 2007, uh, Pastor Stadler uh, came and consecrated our first bishop of the BFLC, Reverend Shalim Raju. Um, and so, uh, and then more recently in the last 13 years, St. James and their, uh, and uh, St. James has helped uh, the uh, ongoing theological education of other pastors outside the BFLC in uh, the form of an annual theological symposium. We started that in 2007 and we continue uh, this uh, uh, wonderful resource for other pastors to this very day. Now, now we look towards 2021 uh, post pandemic and now we enter a new phase in this post uh, COVID pandemic world. And as we look at our ongoing partnership with St. James Lutheran Church. Now, as we focus in the future, we need to look at the past. And the wonderful work God has been achieved in the last 40 years. This also involves engaging our next generation uh, of believers in our churches to continue to carry out this very same mission, expanding our outreach of the gospel to the millions of Hindus and Muslims in India. Now, we want to also use some of the technology we have 
to help uh, create a greater web presence and online engagement of the believers in India and fellow believers here in the US as the world is quickly shrinking thanks to our technology. Now, uh, I'd like to just say a few things about BFLC congregations. In the past 40 years, our churches started very small. There were house churches. There were five to 10 women. As you can see in the photograph there with the lady standing with the little boy, this was the typical church uh, that you would see uh, in the BFLC if you were to come and see our congregations in the early 80s. And, uh, and so uh, oftentimes when the missionaries would come, the men would stand in the back or more likely outside looking through the windows curiously as to the missionaries and uh, what we were there to, to, to say and speak. But now in the past 40 years, we see the work of the church by the power of God. Now our churches are filled with both men and women and children. Some of them are new believers, but we also see children who grew up in the church and are now bringing their own families to, uh, to our churches. And they, and we have a greater involvement and enthusiasm of young men and young women who are actively working in our congregations. And we have, if time per permitting, we have a video that, uh, of, of, a, of a Christmas celebration in one of our villages that was done entirely by some young men. I think they were probably somewhere between ages 10 through 16. Now our churches, as, we, as the churches have uh, gone on through the years, have become more self-sufficient, self which we were hoping to take place. Uh, they're self-sufficient with their needs, and they're seeing the importance of contributing towards the church out of the first, out of their first fruits. Now, BFLC still partners with the churches for constraints, uh, but the churches definitely are on their way for self-sufficiency. Now, it's very important to note that the focus of our congregational work provides a very framework out of which all of our other ministries flow. Now you can see a couple more thoughts. There's a picture of people standing by the river. That's the Krishna River along where most of our early churches were, um, were, um, were uh, founded. And oftentimes when you'd come to an island congregation, you, your boat will pull up, mm -hmm. will be waiting for you there and would greet you and would take you by the hand and help you out of the boat and they would take you into their village and uh, we would have wonderful fellowship. And so I know members of St. James can certainly appreciate how special it is for us to go to those island villages and to see those very special people who have a, a wonderful faith. So um, now we'll move on to the BFLC seminary. Now, since the beginning of the BFLC, we have always invested in pastoral education and, and teaching because many of our pastors didn't have a formal seminary education. Many of them uh, uh, were provided with ongoing teaching, even as they carried what they learned that week to their congregation members on Sundays when they preached. Now, our seminary was formally established in 1995 with our first graduation class in 2003. Now, this was also the first visit when Pastor Arbeck uh, came uh, from St. James and he conferred the diplomas and ordained our first group of pastors, uh, a total of five of them in 2003. So it was a wonderful introduction for, pa for Pastor Arbeck to the, to the work of the BFLC. Now, many of you also know that Dr. Raj Kumar uh, had been our president for the last 20 years in the seminary and he uh, passed away last year and, uh, and now we have a new era where there's a new vision of uh, the seminary and possible Bible college and using ongoing online theological training with the virtual classrooms, maybe using pastors and, and teachers from all over the world. So our pastors uh, can have this ongoing teaching and training uh, no matter how far the distance is. So we're very excited about the future of the BFLC seminary. You can see there's a picture uh, of our most recent uh, symposium that we had 
Uh, this was the virtual classroom with the students standing back there and Pastor Albrecht teaching from Texas, people able to come up and ask questions. And um, it was a very well-received and a very successful uh, uh, symposium uh, under the current COVID circumstances. Now, moving forward, uh, the Moriah Children's Home, which some of you may not know, goes back way in 1984. And this is uh, a, a home uh, for children who have lost one or both parents. These children, uh, however, have extended families, such as grandparents and uncles, whose homes they go to on holidays and school breaks. So they're not completely orphaned in the way that we might understand. Now the Moriah home since 1984 has served hundreds of children who have gone on to successful occupations all over India. We've even had a couple of pastors who grew up in the Moriah children's home. Now we're trying, thanks to technology, of being able to bring some of these alum, uh, alumni from the Moriah home and bringing them all together so that we can have a fellowship and have a common uh, 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 way for us to, 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 to uh, reconnect again and share our experiences. Currently, our Moriah home has 16 girls and 14 boys. Now, we go to the Moriah School. The Moriah School was founded in 1999 by my late mother, uh, Ms., uh, Mrs. Karuna Dasri, which many of you have known personally. Now the children here come primarily from non-Christian disadvantaged background. The parents themselves don't have any formal education, so they can't even advocate for their own children's education. And many of them come from lower socioeconomic background. But so to build on the success of the past 20 years of, of our, our school, this is a new door to further improve the school by giving a greater vision to help and improve the school as we look to 2021 and beyond. So at this moment, I would like to introduce you to Ms. Madeline Krinke, uh, who would like, to, would like to speak a little bit more about some of the new initiatives that we are taking with respect to the Moria School. Uh, Ms. Madeline? Thank you, Paul, for inviting me. And thank you, uh, St. James, for letting me come on your mission uh, journey with you in 2019. My first journey to India was in 2017 with my husband, with a uh, beautiful Savior Lutheran Church of Plymouth. And uh, the first visit was wonderful. We experienced the love of Jesus as we visited the members of the churches and also at the school. We were absolutely um, thrilled with getting to meet people from many of the uh, different congregations and the children. Um, we were able to witness firsthand how their education uh, is so important to them. A uh, little bit about the school. They, uh, before COVID, had 83 preschool to kindergarten children and a total of 235 in the school. And even though we know that most of them were, are from Hindu homes, um, they all get to hear and experience God's word and love. Uh, watching them worship uh, each day before they begin their school day and reciting from Luther's catechism was just amazing. Uh, I don't think our children here memorize the catechism like, like they memorize it. And it's also in English. So uh, part of this is uh, building on English, uh, their language skills. Um, we're building on the success of uh, what's already happened. And um, with that, we're looking forward to a new adventure, which is to build a base for their future success. The students at Mariah deserve the best education, starting with the strongest foundational skills to set them on the path to academic career and life success. The early childhood education provides a learning environment that allows children to think to learn and learn how to solve problems as they progress and grow. Next slide. The child-centered uh, environment that is planned for Mariah in the, future, in the next school year 
is really transformational. Uh, an excellent early childhood education provides the beginning of life-changing education. They will learn 21st century specific skill sets that teach how to learn, replacing rote learning. It'll be activity-based, hands-on learning to achieve learner outcomes. The joy of learning establishes confidence and independence for a lifetime. And English is at the heart of our early childhood education. Developing English proficiency at an early age is an advantage for a lifetime. We have started an early education uh, program to assist with uh, uh, honing the skills of the teachers with their English skills, as well as teaching the children. We had just gotten started with our little program last January when COVID hit. So we've had a pause on helping in that area. But as we are sitting by, we're not being idle. There are a number of educators who have joined the team and have put together uh, the needs for building an early childhood education center that will actually transform how education is delivered at the school. It will be in alignment with the Indian uh, education policy of 2020, a very new concept for India, uh, where early childhood begins with really birth to, to eight years old. Um, mostly, uh, we have mostly four, four year olds in the preschool program at Mariah, and they will be, um, the next slide I think shows, Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I missed a slide. What they will be able to do is um, experience um, the Western style of a preschool, and which is really the, the teaching foundation and the basis for the change. Uh, so we have, um, I can go to the next uh, slide. We have a, a complete program really uh, set out for you for a little more information on just the early childhood education and it's a special event planned for Monday, March 1 at 6.30. And we invite you all to come and join us for a virtual journey to the Early Childhood Education Center at Mariah School. And prior to that, please visit the website, www.mariahchildren.com. Uh, and there's a lot more information there and also a place where you can volunteer if you're interested in joining us on this journey. Thank you. Madeline, thank you very much. Uh, Madeline and Arlen have had many years of uh, education in, uh, in, uh, in Christian, many years of, of, uh, of uh, experience in Christian education and uh, we really thank them for their uh, their vision and for looking at our school with a with a with a with a new outlook. Um, we're very very excited uh, of uh, the things that uh, are going to happen in our in our schools going forward. Now, I would like to transition to we talked about literature of uh, publishing of the BFLC. Now, this was not a very big area of our focus in the beginning. But in the last 10 years or so, 10, 15 years, this has become uh, more uh, of a, uh, a ministry for us. And this is, once again, the church asking uh, how we can not only just help our own Bible faith Lutheran church, but how can we help other believers, other church bodies in a country where everybody is overwhelmingly not Christian. So our translation, uh, our translation and partnership uh, Partners that are many. Uh, we part. We partnered with the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Some of you may know they publish theological uh, uh, works in different languages all over the world. Uh, and we are working towards finishing the Book of Concord. And we've already uh, published uh, large and small catechisms uh, in uh, as a, as a as a joint project. Uh, we've partnered with a Luther Academy and St. James Lutheran Church uh, when we hosted these annual pastoral symposium. So we invite uh, a, a bunch of pastors outside our mm -hmm. own synod to come and learn. Uh, we take a topic such as prayer or uh, baptism or forgiveness. 
uh, some broad concepts and we, we teach, we have a two to three day session with multiple teachers uh, speaking and it's very well received. People really appreciate uh, the, the care uh, and concern that we have for our local pastors outside the BFLC. We have a wonderful working relationship with that. Uh, some of our other partners are the uh, seminaries in the LCMS, both Fort Wayne and St. Louis. We've had a number of professors who have come and taught at our seminary and in our annual symposia. So we have ongoing relationship with these institutions. And now we're looking towards some more exciting uh, areas where we can help the believers directly all over India. We're looking towards translating uh, the Good News magazine uh, for believers in our, our Indian languages. If some of you may not know, it's a very uh, beautifully illustrated devotional and topical uh, magazine, uh, very well put together. And we think uh, if we were to translate these and give them to believers in India in all those different languages, it would really help uh, strengthen the church. Now, uh, the other big partner that we're hoping uh, to, uh, that we're planning on uh, partnering with is the Lutheran Braille Workers Organization. This is a 75 year old organization that provides free Braille and large print Bibles to anyone uh, who wants it all over the world who are blind or sight impaired. The plan currently is to have a, a Braille and large print production center at the BFLC headquarters. And our BFLC will help distribute these Braille materials and large print Bibles all over India and also possibly other nearby Asian countries. So now this brings us to uh, finally to the Lutheran Study Bible Project, uh, which we will formally call the mm -hmm. India Bible Study. So let's talk about this. Uh, now the India Bible Study inquiry is a project primarily uh, that has formed so we can translate the Lutheran Study Bible that was published by Concordia Publishing House in 2009. Now, unlike some other study Bibles, nearly 600 members have contributed to uh, the formation of the study Bible who, from all over the world. And the Lutheran study Bible uh, is heavy with references from our church fathers, from apostolic time to the medieval and reformation time. Now the focus of the notes is is to rightfully understand the Holy Scripture through the illumination of the Holy Spirit from, and from the, written, from the written witness of the early church writings. This book has nearly 2,300 pages and is one of the most in-depth study Bibles that are out there in the market. Now, these notes have also been written with questions that the lady might ask after reading scriptures. So right now, what the project is, we are translating the study notes uh, on the bottom of the, the Bible passages. Now, these are very, very extensive. And what we're doing is we're translating these notes into the vernacular language, and we're using the biblical text from these uh, uh, languages on top. So our translators are taking uh, the language and uh, looking at both the English uh, notes and what it says in the vernacular and bringing a, a wonderful unified and a polished translation for the people of India. Now, the CPH leadership, the Concordia Publishing leadership had visited India in 2010 and we had agreed at that time to translate the study notes in Telugu, but the Lord had other plans. And uh, due to various things, events, uh, this project was on hold uh, until 2018. And now through God's timing and through his intervention, the vision has been much bigger. And in, since 2018, uh, we have pushed towards translating not only in Telugu, but in all major Indian languages. Instead of reaching 70 million people who speak Telugu, we are, the Lord has opened our eyes to reach for over a billion people with the number of languages that we are going to cover. 
Now you can see there's a, a list, there's a map with uh, the languages that are spoken in India. And so right now we cover all of the Southern Indian languages that include uh, Tamil, Malayalam starting at the bottom and Canada and Telugu. Uh, so those are the four languages that are in process uh, and uh, for the last two and a half years. And now in the last year, we have started the Hindi, Punjabi, uh, and soon uh, Urdu, which is spoken by North Indians and also people in Pakistan. Now, those are the two areas, but Lord willing, we will have another uh, group of languages in the north, in the in the northeast part of India uh, as well going forward. So now you might ask, why do we need a study Bible in India? Um, and but if you were a new believer in India, you lived in a village, all you have is the Bible. Now sometimes there may not be pastors, and uh, you don't have online resources to look up things. And uh, and of course, uh, some of the theological things that come on TV are are just uh, not as good <laughs> as we would like to like uh, as as we would like to think. And uh, and so uh, so there is uh, so there's uh, a, a great opportunity for us to be able to to do this. Uh, when we're doing this in all these languages, we get to to actually uh, do something that hasn't been done before. There's no study Bible uh, that touches all the languages, all the major languages in India. And we have a great opportunity to do this. We have a great opportunity to bring all these languages together under the umbrella of a wonderful uh, study Bible uh, notes and uh, exposition. I believe this is a great way to help catechize believers, believers in all conscience as they try to understand how God graciously deals with us through the law and gospel. Now, our current languages uh, right now are seven, uh, and we have uh, Dr. Uh, Gerald Praveen for Tamil, Dr. J. Sri Gerald for Malayalam. You'll see Dr. J. Sri there, and Dr. Gerald is in the in the in the in the pink or fuchsia, and then we have Dr. Victor Moses uh, in the in the, in the uh, uh, yellow color. Uh, that is, he's the Telugu uh, coordinator. We also happen to have, uh, which I'd like to introduce in just a moment, uh, Reverend Joseph Singh, who is uh, in charge of the Hindi, Punjabi, and Urdu translation as well. Now you might you might wonder how do we do this translation? Can we go to the next slide, please? So right here, this is an example of a Malayalam translation. Here you can see there's a number of steps that we do, uh, starting it, uh, translating the script, typing it, proofreading it, comparatively reading it, formatting it checking it for language and theology, and final reading and putting footnotes. This is a very tedious and a very prolonged process, and it's a very careful process uh, because we certainly uh, are uh, some, and it's, certain, and it's certainly time consuming, and we wanna make sure that we do a very, very good job of this uh, as uh, it's not uh, something that is easy to, to re repeat going forward in the future. So this translation process involves many people uh, along uh, as uh, this uh, lang as this uh, each language uh, comes into uh, into uh, reality. So um, we'll go to the next slide. So to support this uh, big project, we have uh, started a a board and a nonprofit called the India Bible Study. Now, it's interesting, we didn't call it the India Study Bible. Why, you might ask? It's because we're planning on doing more than simply publishing or producing the work, which I will, go on, which I will explain in just a moment. Uh, this 
organization that we just started uh, is a 501c3 organization that's registered in Minnesota. We have a board of directors. We have Dr. Michael Albrecht and Paul Farley uh, from St. James involved along with myself and, um, uh, and Ruth Martin, uh, who is uh, from Michigan. Um, uh, this board will help provide guidance for the translation and help fundraise and coordinate the projects. Uh, there's a lot of um, complicated work that is completely out of most of our wheelhouses, uh, such as negotiating contracts uh, cop and copyrights with publishers, such as CPH or the Bible Society of India, or dealing with printing companies uh, or printing and publishing. But the purpose of having uh, us calling ourselves the India Bible study is that we're going to do more than just simply producing this work. Our purpose is to take this work and take it into the churches, into the church bodies and to engage with the believers as well. So that this comes back to that mission that I had talked about, that everything that we do flows from congregational work. And so, and eventually we would like to use this current technology uh, such as e-publishing, -pu e to bring some of these products into our smartphones and Kindles and tablets and other electronic media. And so um, with this, uh, I would like to uh, maybe uh, ha see if Dr. Uh, uh, Reverend uh, Joseph Singh could uh, greet, give us a, a brief greeting uh, to, the, to all of us who are gathered here. Pastor Joseph Singh. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity uh, to talk to you. And also, it's really a great honor and privilege to be here with you today. Uh, I'm uh, Pastor Joseph Singh. Uh, I'm from India, and I'm here with my wife, Hilda. Hello. All right. We are both... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, pastor's children. So my father was a pastor. Hilda's pa uh, father was also a pastor. He was a Methodist pastor. My father was from the Church of North India, CNI. And uh, I was an army officer in the Indian Army before coming here to uh, Canada. We came here in 2001 after having served the Indian Army for 24 years. Uh, I came with my wife, Hilda, and uh, my two children. So we have uh, two grandchildren now from my son and my daughter also. They all live close by here. They're married. Uh, in Canada, I was called by our Savior Lutheran Church, Etobicoke, Toronto, in 2006 to be their missionary or lay missionary. And I served them for 14 years till 2020. Uh, and we started a Hindi, Urdu, Punjabi fellowship uh, at our Savior Lutheran Church. And we carried out a whole lot of translation work. Firstly, we start, translated the uh, small catechism into Punjabi, and which is still uh, not finished, uh, although uh, the Enkiridian part has been done but we are uh, doing that, uh, the whole uh, catechism and the long catechism also. Uh, I was uh, uh, made uh, the, I was called uh, to fill a vacancy here at Risen Christ Lutheran Church, Mississauga, uh, in, in January 2020. And I served them till you know, August 2020 till my nephew who graduated from St. Catherine's, uh, our, our, uh, our seminary at St. Catherine's, and he came uh, as their call pastor. Uh, thereafter, uh, from September onwards, uh, I have uh, got involved with, uh, you know, after Dr. Paul gave me an invitation uh, to come and start this work uh, for 
our Lutheran study Bible translation into the Indian languages. Uh, so uh, he asked me if I could uh, join them and slowly, uh, you know, they got me involved and here I am uh, with you all that uh, I have been entrusted with this uh, responsibility of uh, doing uh, the translation work into Hindi, uh, Punjabi, and also uh, a little bit of Roman Urdu, which we have, uh, we, which we did in our uh, fellowship here at our Savior Lutheran Church. Uh, so, so that is where we are at. And right now we have started the translation work of the uh, study Bible. Uh, we are doing the Psalms into Hindi and into the Punjabi languages. Uh, so we have just started this uh, from January this year. Uh, so we hope to uh, accomplish this task maybe by about June or July. Uh, that's where we stand uh, today. Uh, that's it uh, for now. Hope to uh, bring more uh, news to you uh, later. But we've also been entrusted with the task of uh, translating the good news. Uh, so I was given and given this responsibility that I should choose and select just one, uh, you know, edition. And uh, at our last meeting, we decided that we will go ahead with the uh, with uh, this prayer uh, edition of the good news. So we are going to translate that into the Hindi language and also the Punjabi languages. And let's see how fast we can do that. I've been asked to give that, uh, send it to other uh, directors and uh, the coordinators of other languages so that they can also start uh, simultaneously with the same uh, edition of the good news. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Singh. We appreciate uh, all the work that you've done uh, and all the work that uh, our translation directors are done. We will be getting close to uh, getting done with the New Testament in uh, a few of the languages uh, along with the Psalms by the end of this, uh, uh, this summer. So we look forward to being able to share some of this work to various members who speak these languages natively to get their feedback. And so we're very excited about how the Lord is using the BFLC to reach his people all over India. Even though they're far away, they may not speak the same language, but we feel very, very honored that the Lord would use our small little church to do his work. And so we take we accept uh, that with uh, all humility and uh, we uh, pray that God would continue to equip and enable us, would give us uh, the uh, wisdom to do this great task. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, uh, is not uh, uh, something that, uh, that I feel that uh, without the miraculous intervention of uh, God and the Holy Spirit that uh, we could uh, accomplish any of this. So continue to pray for us. And so I want to finish by thanking each and every one of you for listening. Thank you for your prayers and for your support. Thank you for your partnership. And we look forward to 2021. We look forward to a, a post-pandemic world where we're going to show the true, uh, the, the true life that we have that, is, uh, that we receive in God and how uh, no pestilence or... Uh, or anything can really uh, take away the joy and the full life that we have in Christ Jesus. So with that, I would like to turn this over to Pastor uh, and Dr. Michael Albrecht to, uh, to continue uh, uh, the uh, program. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Paul. And thank you, Pastor Singh. Thank you, Marilyn. I hope that all of you who are following along have uh, learned some things that will inspire you to continue to pray for the work that's being done over there. Of course, we pray for the Bible Faith Lutheran Church in our services every Sunday, and I trust that many of you are also praying at home. 
and now maybe you've discovered some new things that you can pray about. Uh, we certainly covet your prayers and uh, appreciate them, and uh, without them, we wouldn't get very far. Uh, if you are inclined to get more involved personally, we're also looking for volunteers who could help in a number of ways. If you have a special interest in the school or in the uh, English for Mariah project, the uh, early childhood education, if you have any background or experience or just interest in that, I'd appreciate it if you would just contact me and let me know that and we'll find a way to plug you in. You've already heard that there's going to be a, uh, a special event coming up on March 1st, which will provide more information about the Mariah School and the Early, edu early Childhood Education Program. And that will also be a fundraiser. And so uh, that would be another chance where people could plug in. Uh, we're getting ready to purchase some equipment for the school and then make arrangements to ship it over there. And if these are areas where you have some interest, I'd appreciate knowing about that. As far as the Bible translation project goes, as Paul has already said, we're wading into waters that are new to us. And so if anyone happens to know something about publishing or about uh, the whole process of distributing published works in our world today, whether it be electronically or hard copy, uh, we would appreciate any advice you might be able to offer us, or if you'd like to get involved with our newly constituted board, uh, we'd be happy to uh, hear from you. So please let me know about that too. And then of course, uh, we're always happy to receive financial support. And there are a number of ways that you can do that. Uh, you can funnel your support through St. James, or you can also visit the bflcfriends.com website and there are ways that you can do it directly there. I hope this has been uh, time well spent. I've enjoyed it myself. Uh, 